Uh, and in this case, I managed to chart out all of the Iranian banks and their relationships. And what I found out was fascinating. First, if you see these 17 banks here, if you go to the next slide, they were, they were banks around the world that were providing it with currencies. Uh, you'll see here the dollar, the euro, the pound, the yen, etc. But what was more interesting, not only was the currencies, but which banks were actually conducting this business. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a complete list of 44 banks around the world. If you go to the next slide, those 44 banks are providing Iran with correspondent banking services. And their household names, ING, uh, Bank Tokyo Mitsubishi, uh, Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, and I was able to provide all of the bank account numbers and the SWIFT codes for these correspondent accounts. So in other words, mapping out a financial map of these particular financial institutions. Then I wanted to figure out how to basically give leverage to Congress. And so what I did was I mapped that back to the United States. So in other words, which banks, so you have the Iranian banks in the center, then you have the banks around them that were supporting them, and then which banks were, were in the United States supporting those banks. If you go to the next slide, probably clarify things. Uh, one more. So you'll see in the center, there are 30 Iranian banks. Okay? Four have been designated by the UN, 17 were designated by the US. Then there are 44 international banks that are servicing the designated entities. And then there are 40, uh, then there are banks in the United States that are supporting those banks. So the lever point is actually which US banks are doing business with the international community who's doing business with designated entities. So there you have examples like J.P. Morgan, Wells, Bank of New York that are doing business with the Deutsche Banks, the Commerce Banks, the INGs, the, Bank of, uh, the Tokyo Mitsubishis that are doing business with the designated entities. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention where Iran itself had branches around the world. If you go to the next slide, there are UN and US de designated banks that have offices all over the world, including Asia, Europe, South America. And if you go to the next slide, You'll see there you have banks, Iranian designated banks operating in Afghanistan, Armenia, Hong Kong, Paris, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Athens, Baghdad, Rome, uh, and a bunch of other well-known places. And these are designated banks by the United Nations that are operating in friendly countries. Um, let me wrap up by talking a little bit about the sanctions regime and CESADA, the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions and Divestment Act. Uh, some of the members of Congress talked about this waiver ability. I'll point out that in the way that Cesada was actually written, this is an unbelievable bill. It's a sunlight bill. If the government actually asks for a waiver, it has to actually come back to you and tell you why it's asking for that waiver. That's number one. Number two, I ask you to remember that what brought down the South African uh, apartheid regime was actually banking sanctions, not anything else. And then finally, um, uh, this is basically a clean hands bill. U.S. banks now need to certify not only who their customers are, but who their customers' customers are. And this is a sea change. So in other words, J.P. Morgan or Boney or Citibank are going to have to declare that not only they are not doing business with a designated entity, but none of their customers' customers, none of the banks that they're working with are dealing with designated entities. With the passing of Cesada, we have all the tools necessary to pursue and punish banks doing business with Iran. If we're truly going to stop Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons, it's prudent, it would be prudent for us to use all the arrows in our quiver. Thank you for your uh, time, and I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Mr. Dubowitz. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa and distinguished members of the committee. And, and thank you, Mr. George, for his work on banking. President Obama has made it very clear that stopping Iran's nuclear weapons is a priority. His administration can potentially achieve this by striking at the Iranian energy sector. Let's be clear, the Iranian energy sector is the lifeblood of the Iranian regime. Oil export revenues constitute 80% of export earnings, 76% of government revenues. Iran's natural gas reserves are second in the world only to Russia's. Energy wealth enables the Iranian regime to fund its proliferation and terrorism activities, as well as a vast system of repression. The threat of sanctions has persuaded many foreign companies to stop doing business with Iran, but many more remain. The regime increasingly relies on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to manage the energy industry, and this makes IRGC leaders and IRGC entities prime targets for sanctions. The U.S. Treasury has adopted this approach, as we heard this morning, 
with IRGC designations in 2007 and 2010 for proliferation and terrorist activities. And Mr. Chairman, as we heard this morning, international energy sanctions are gaining significant support abroad. The new UN Security Council resolution establishes for the very first time the nexus between the Iranian energy sector and proliferation activities. And this is a very important development. And in fact, this development provided political cover to the EU, Canada, and Australia to finally impose their own tough energy sanctions. In parallel, as we heard this morning, the new U.S. legislation expands the Iran Sanctions Act, and it goes after almost all of the Iranian energy supply chain, almost all, and, and we can talk about what it doesn't address in, in Q&A. Now, critics, as we've heard, dismiss sanctions as a feckless measure that will enrich Chinese and Russian opportunists at the expense of Americans and Europeans. I believe that energy sanctions are not a silver bullet, but they are silver shrapnel, and shrapnel can wound this regime as part of a comprehensive economic warfare strategy. The mere possibility of energy sanctions has had an impact. During Ahmadinejad's first four years in office, foreign direct investment plummeted by 64 percent from $4.2 billion to $1.5 billion. In fact, without an annual investment of $25 billion, Iran could become a net importer of oil. Now, the result are uh, the Iranians despise this regime, not only for its human rights abuses, but for the disastrous state of the economy. Imagine what serious sanctions vigorously enforced could do. This presents an opportunity to policymakers. We can leverage the economic malaise in Iran and the political frustration as expressed by the Green Movement, the Bazari merchant class, and disaffected clerics. Now, this is not to say that sanctions are going to have their desired impact. Iran has decades of experience circumventing sanctions. It is implementing countermeasures today. It is using front companies and cutouts and smuggling. And hotspots for this activity include Dubai and Malaysia, Turkey, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Furthermore, if sanctions are not enforced, companies may assess that their interests are really not in jeopardy, given Washington's poor historical record of sanctions enforcement. And we're going to face serious challenges to enforcement from China and Russia, but also Turkey and Iraq, Brazil, Venezuela, and perhaps even India. This administration now has more authority to counter the Iranian threat than any administration in U.S. history. And it should be commended for establishing broad international support for these sanctions. But let's be clear, we only have a very limited window before Iran realizes its nuclear ambitions. To this end, I present you the following recommendations. The first is enforce U.S. law. The credibility of sanctions depends on the willingness of the U.S. to sanction violators. Nothing will focus minds like stiff penalties and the denial of federal contracts. It's worth remembering that the U.S. government imposed almost a billion dollars worth of fines against three European financial institutions for violations of U.S. sanctions law. That sent a ripple of fear through the financial industry. We need to send the same ripples of fear throughout the energy sector. Now also remember that this new law is not just about gasoline. In addition to banking sanctions, it also leverages the full scope of U.S. laws by sanctioning companies that provide technology, goods, and services to the Iranian oil and natural gas sectors. It also targets energy projects outside of Iran, where foreign companies are partnering with Iranian-controlled government entities in projects off the coast of Scotland, in Croatia, in Azerbaijan, and elsewhere. We need to encourage Europe to enforce its energy sanctions because, after all, this will be the ceiling for action by other allies, particularly in Asia and the Gulf. We should harmonize our sanctions laws with the EU. We did this in a commission uh, that successfully coordinated sanctions against Serbia, and those sanctions were very effective. We should expand Treasury's list of energy-related entities. The IRGC operates thousands of front organizations that contribute to Iran's energy sector. Targeted sanctions work only if there are sufficient targets. And finally, we need to expose every foreign company that does business in Iran's energy sector. I believe Congress should establish a standing bipartisan advisory board on sanctions enforcement, a bipartisan congressional commission, to collect open source and classified research, make recommendations, hold hearings, to ensure that sanctions are enforced. For sanctions to work, they must cripple the Iranian energy sector, 
and if sanctions yield no compromise from Iran's leaders on its nuclear program, no one can argue that America and its allies did not try all peaceful options. On behalf of the Foundation for Defense Democracies, I, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, and let me thank both of you for your, your testimony. I guess let me begin with you, Mr. George. I mean, some of these banks are the biggest banks. I mean, uh, uh, why have they been able to get away with this? Some of you had on that uh, chart were some of the biggest. I mean, how did they get away with that? You can't cut your mic on. Yeah. In general, banking is not a transparent business. When you have a bank account, not everyone knows about those bank accounts. Uh, before, this, before this came out, before I put out this study, there was nothing on bank accounts or Iranian bank accounts or otherwise in the, in, on the internet, on the ether. This is the first expose of their accounts all over the world. So that's the reason you think that, uh, that's the reason why they were getting away with you saying. The okay. Treasury Department is not in the habit of calling out, naming and shaming international banks that are doing business with designated entities. Right. Mr. Mr. Dubowitz, um, do you believe that our U.S. sanctions are strong enough or should we do something else? I mean, well, I think U.S. sanctions are certainly strong and I think if we vigorously enforce them and if we impose crippling sanctions against these companies, again, I think it will send a ripple of fear through the energy sector. I mean, our friends in Treasury have done a superb job in persuading many financial institutions to stop doing business in Iran. But let's remember, as I said in my testimony, the U.S. government and the District Attorney of New York imposed a billion dollars worth of fines on three European banks between 2005 and 2009. And that focused minds in the financial sector. We have never sanctioned any energy companies. And I believe that if we impose the equivalent of a billion dollars worth of fines on the Turkish and Chinese and Malaysian and other companies that are continuing to do business in the gasoline trade and in the oil and natural gas sectors, that could have a profound effect. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, do you believe that the U.S. and EU sanctions on Iran will effectively reduce the number of foreign firms conducting business in Iran? Do well, you think I it will reduce the number? I was in Brussels a couple of weeks ago meeting with uh, the key drafters of the U.S. sanctions order, and I think the Europeans have gone very far in the energy sector. What they didn't provide were sanctions against the supply of gasoline, and a number of European companies have been involved in that supply chain for many years, though reportedly they are out. They have cut off or prohibited investment in technology transfer and technical assistance, and again, I think this is sending a message to European energy firms that Iran is not open for business. But again, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that our European friends are going to enforce those laws. The commercial relationship between the EU and Iran is enormous and, and growing. Right. Uh, Mr. George, um, you have spent time both as a former Treasury uh, official and as a private consultant tracking how Iran manages its resources within the international economy. Uh, can you discuss why you believe effective sanctions enforcement against Iran banking sector in particular is so important to halting Iran's nuclear weapon program? Uh, so if you look historically, uh, one of the things, again, as I mentioned in my testimony, that brought down the South African apartheid regime was banking sanctions, firstly. In addition, if Iran doesn't have access to the international market, it can't procure uh, currency, it can't send wire transfers. If it doesn't have the hub of the banking sector, it can only rely on the informal ways of moving money. There's only four ways of moving money. There's the banking sector, the informal financial sector, cash, and commodities. Mr. Dubowitz talked about the commodity side of the house, gas, oil. Uh, but if, they don't ha if, if, you, if you cut off the banking sector, what does the regime have left? It's much more difficult for them to move money. Um, this is really one of the lifebloods of the regime. And if you're able to cut off the banking community from Iran, it becomes much more difficult for them, for them to move money. And that's the power that this last uh, uh, sanctions legislation actually passed. U.S. financial institutions will have to certify that they're not doing business with anyone who's doing business with a designated entity. That effectively, that's a third-party sanction. If, if that really does go through, you'll find that most banks will pull out of the market. Right. 
On that note, uh, I yield back and I uh, call a gentlewoman from New York, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Well, I, I'd like the, to thank both the gentlemen for their um, testimony. And first to ask uh, Mr. Jorish, uh, the central bank is not covered under the sanctions. Iraq's, Iran's central bank is not covered. So what does that mean? Won't they, in terms of trying to put sanctions on them? And what is the role that clearing houses are playing? Um, can you give specific examples of how the clearing houses might be used to get around the sanctions? And again, the, the exemption, if, am I correct that the exemption, there is an exemption for the central bank of Iran from the sanctions? And won't that, what, what impact does that have on it? Uh, I'll work backwards. There is an exemption for the central bank. It hasn't been designated by the United States or the United Nations, and it's certainly a hole in the sanctions regime. If you don't designate every Iranian bank, you're effectively there's a hole in the sanctions regime. So that's firstly. In terms of uh, clearing houses, there's one huge scheme. It's called the Asian Clearing Union. It's based out of Tehran, and it's a conglomerate of uh, somewhere between eight and ten countries, the central banks of eight and ten countries. And they get together, and they essentially are moving money through this clearing house. And Iran effectively is moving up to 10 percent of its imports and exports yearly. Its biggest trading partner in the Asian Clearing Union is India. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way for them to procure dollars and euros and evade sanctions. Uh, I've written about this at length. Uh, this is this is a this is one of the biggest holes outside of the the formal financial sector, the banking community. And until the United States government either designates or uh, puts them on some kind of sanctions regime, they're going to be able to move money through this formalized informal financial sector. Well, Mr. Chairman, maybe we should close that loophole if, if you're if, if they're pointing out. Uh, but, Mr. Uh, Dubowitz, I, I'd like to uh, ask you about the international community. We heard in the prior session that we had from State Department that uh, we have been successful this time in engaging uh, the international community with the exception of Turkey and uh, China and Russia, and we're working on those countries. But in the past, parts of the U European Union did not really work with us. On, on the sanctions. What has happened that they are now willing to be part of this effort? Could you give your interpretation of what is happening in the international community and uh, what impact that will have on, on making them stronger this time? Thank you for the question. First of all, I think we, uh, the U.S. government has done a remarkable job in building international support, but I, I think we should be careful about it. Uh, not exaggerating the level of international support. I mean, what, what essentially we have now is a Security Council resolution, 1929, that lays the predicate for the possibility of further support. We have the Europeans, the Canadians, and the Australians, who so far have, have formally passed their own energy sanctions. Within Europe, there was a lot of debate within the 27 uh, member union over sanctions. You had the French very aggressive. In fact, the French were willing to include refined petroleum sanctions as part of the final sanctions package. But you had countries like Sweden and others who were pushing back for a variety of reasons. So there's still a lot of dissension and disagreement within the European Union. You, d you don't see that in the final executive order, in the final sanctions order, but you will see that in enforcement. And I think we should uh, be very cautious about uh, congratulating the Europeans until we see what they're going to do on the enforcement side. Are the Germans, who have the largest trade relationship with Iran in the EU, are, go are they going to move forward on some of these remaining banks and on the technology companies and infrastructure players that play a critical role in supporting the Iranian energy sector? So I think the uh, time for celebration will be when we see the Europeans also imposing their own stiff penalties and sanctions against their own firms or firms that are operating on European soil. And I wonder if I could just sure. follow up on that for just a moment. I want you to, I, I'd like for you to recall the fact that there are designated Iranian banks sitting in London, Paris, Rome, Frankfurt, Hamburg. The, the, the new legislation barred any new business from taking place with these banks, but not pre-existing business. And a lot of our European allies are congratulating themselves when, in fact, they're allowing old contracts to go through and using these designated Iranian banks on their soil. They have not closed down these banks in Europe. And they are among our closest allies, would you not say, in Europe and Asia and 
the Middle East and they have the, the uh, physical branch uh, operations uh, from the Iranian banks. Uh, so you, you don't, do you think that we went far enough or we should have had uh, covered also the existing businesses? Mr. Jordish. The existing businesses, in other words, the, the existing banks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we had the, the, the we essentially used the ability we had. We leveraged the U.S. financial system. We told these banks you can choose between us and you can choose between them. Um, it was a clean hands bill. All these U.S. banks now need to certify that they're not doing business with anyone who's doing business with the designated entities. In other words, it forces these European, Asian, and South, Af South, Af South American uh, banks to basically f choose between us and them. Uh, in terms of the Iranian banks, there's very little leverage we have. Um, there's very little leverage we have other than going through the United Nations and uh, the State Department. What about the correspondent banks? Uh, what, what, what role do they play in empowering uh, financial services, uh, expanding financial services for Iran? So that was, that was, the, that was the thrust of my, of my testimony. I listed, I found 44 banks around the world that are providing designated Iranian entities with correspondent banking services. Again, when a, when a, when a bank doesn't have a physical presence in a country, it pays another bank to act as its agent. Those 44 banks are essentially acting as Iran's tentacles around the world. And they, a lot of those banks have a physical presence here in the States. Deutsche Bank, Commerce Bank, they have branches here and, they op and they're basically working with designated entities. Those 44 banks also maintain correspondent banking relationships with our own financial institutions. Again, JP Morgan, Citibank, uh, uh, Boney. Th so w the, we are, ex the, the, this latest round of sanctions, we're using the power we have because we're forcing our own financial institutions uh, to certify that they're not doing business with anyone. Well, my time has expired, yeah, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, gentlelwoman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a big supporter of trying to use sanctions, trying to make it work. But I'm going to be the devil's advocate a little bit here today uh, for both of you. Uh, I did international banking, if you will, in the import-export business for years. Everybody's got a correspondent bank. Hong Kong, Shanghai prides itself on having a correspondent relationship basically with everybody, as does J.P. Morgan and so on. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's why they call a lot of these guys financial center banks. Ultimately, isn't it true, Mr. George, no matter what we do, if they're able to put money into banks, which they can through their private entities that, they, that are essentially non-government, that has mi millions if not billions, they can move it to enough banks that eventually they will always have a correspondent. In your opinion, based on your research, sh in order to actually make banking sanctions work, don't we actually have to create an audit trail of the money, the transactions, a level of transparency on the actual money transactions, what they're for, who they go to, and follow them on a global basis, and anything less than that, aren't we really sticking our fingers in, a, uh, in the kind of a sieve that we generally uh, you know, put spaghetti in when we're draining it? The short answer is yes. Uh, there's no perfect system. This is never, you're never going to be able to lock out an entire country from the formal financial sector. Having that said, though, Stuart Levy, my former boss at the Treasury Department, always says our job is not to, uh, our job is not to close down the regime. Our job is to make it more difficult and financially painful for them to move their money. And that's well, what this and, does. And to that level, I'd like to ask both of you, uh, All right, good and Mr. Dubowitz, perhaps you could start. I remember how we went after South Africa. They weren't doing a nuclear weapon. Their weapon was the tyranny over their majority. We did it with pure shame. Nobody, we basically shut down in, uh, diplomatic relations with South Africa on a global basis. We did have banking sanctions, but to a great extent what happened was we did not welcome their deposits, period. We were able to get more and more banks to recognize that if you took their deposits, you were taking the equivalent of blood money in diamonds today. To, even though our sanctions are strong, even though I know Treasury is doing the best they can, I'll start with Mr. Dubowitz. The next step that we have to look at, not just government oversight but the Congress, isn't it 
to find those areas in which truly we can change how they're viewed and how they feel they're viewed. And I've been all over the world. I started on foreign affairs in this uh, Congress. The fact is, you find Iranians at the finest hotels. We normally don't stay at those hotels, but if I go to a meeting in those really good hotels, you're going to see Iranians. So isn't that the next step? Diplomatic sanctions, including not having ambassadorial postings of Iranians in countries in Europe. Well, Congressman Issa, that's exactly right. I mean, I think s to take the big picture view of sanctions, sanctions are a way of putting the Iranians in the wrong and keeping them there. I mean, there has been a sea change in the narrative about Iran in even 12 months, even in this august body. 12 months ago, we were talking about a grand bargain with Iran over common interests and common values. You know, today we're talking about... I think about that was down the road about 16 <laughs> blocks. <laughs> uh, now we're talking about uh, how crippling can sanctions be. You know, that is a significant change in the narrative in Washington. It's certainly a significant change in the narrative in Europe. I mean, uh, when I was in Europe 12, 18 months ago, you know, the talk about the Iranian regime and its legitimacy uh, was certainly in the mouths of most diplomats and, and most politicians on both sides of the aisle. So I think these sanctions have played a very important strategic communications role in putting the Iranians in the, in the wrong and keeping them. I think we can go further by, in fact, barring their diplomats, uh, barring their embassies. I, I was born in South Africa. I, I have a sense of what was done actually in South Africa. And I think what was very important there was to target the legitimacy of the South African government, to show the evil nature of apartheid. Now, I want to make just one further comment, because my fear with sanctions, whether it's in the banking sector or in the energy sector, is that we spend the next 12 months playing a game of whack-a-mole. Th that's the game in the carnival that we used to play as kids, where you hit one mole and another one pops up. I think if we spend the next 12 months chasing corresponding banking accounts and gasoline suppliers and technology providers, uh, we're going to have not only our folks at the State Department inundated with work, but I don't think we're going to be targeting the real Achilles heel of the Iranian economy. Unlike South Africa, Iran is a one-crop country. All the Iranians really do is produce energy. And we have to identify a very short list of major investors in the energy sector and major technology providers, of which there are only a few really big ones, and, and I tell you most of them are German, who are providing critical technology to the Iranian natural gas sector. We okay. should identify and, them and, and, and my then, time, my and then time has expired, them. and I agree with you, it was in your testimony. I'm going to just do a yes or no question for both of you at the end. During this time, as we attempt to do that, should we urge the State Department to urge our allies around the world to recall ambassadors and or to discharge Iranian ambassadors as a way of showing without hurting one Iranian citizen, a way of showing that this is not a country that is currently in favor for their actions. Yes. Yes. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for your questions. Um, let me uh, just ask, um, is there anything that we need to do? from a legislative standpoint on this side of the aisle? Well, if I could start, I, I think that Congress can play a critical role in continuing a relentless and determined drive to ensure sanctions are enforced. As I mentioned in my testimony, I think that it would be very valuable to set up a bipartisan commission on Iran sanctions enforcement and to make sure that the staff that is employed there has access to the best information that they are relentless and determined in monitoring what is a very opaque and very complex energy sector and banking sector, and that they are finding the best information in order to ensure that we can name and shame the energy companies and the banks that are doing business with Iran, we can hold hearings, and we can hold uh, the administration to account for its commitment to sanctions enforcement. I think that can be done uh, legislatively, and, and I would suggest that be an important first step. Right. You can be assured we'll hold hearings. <laughs> I uh, wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Dubowitz. I think you, uh, Congress, ought to consider again, just echoing Mark's words, uh, a bipartisan uh, a body that oversees sanctions, that collects this information, brings it out to the public, and holds the administration's feet to the fire on this, and make sure they actually, the implementation is where it, the rubber meets the road here. Writing legislation is great. Passing legislation is wonderful. If there's no implementation, you have nothing. 
gentleman from New York, you have any closing remarks? We can close yeah, now. I, I would like to just follow up with what Mr. Uh, Dubowitz said, that uh, instead of playing whack-a-mole or whack-a-ball, whatever it's called, uh, we should be focusing on the energy sector, which is the key component. And could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? I, I know that the, the bill did not cover refined uh, or address refined petroleum trade. Uh, it did not uh, penalize its companies involved in this trade. And uh, also, uh, their energy needs help from foreign countries, really, for them to develop their energy uh, business. And according to some estimates, about 60 percent of the technology Iran uses to exploit its natural gas resources come f comes from one European nation, uh, Germany, the rest from other U.S allies, uh, Japan, South Korea, Europe. And last week, companies were, were free to provide these products and services to, to Iran and uh, natural gas businesses. Now that has changed, and Congress uh, really uh, gave the, the President, uh, the President has the means now to sanction any company that provides technology, goods, or services valued at 20 million or more in any single year to the Iranian energy industry. Um, what is your opinion of, of how committed the European Union is uh, to stopping the transfer of this key European technology to Iran? Yeah. I was surprised by how tough the EU sanctions were. I would not have expected that three to six months ago. They have gone after very specifically the providers of technology and technical expertise, and they are essentially going after their own companies in writing that order, because they know very well that 60 percent of the key natural gas LNG technology is provided by Germany and France and Holland and other European countries. So they have that in mind. I find it fascinating that they focused on that. Uh, Mr. George is exactly right. They've only focused on new contracts, not existing contracts, which for me provides a massive loophole in which uh, new deals can be characterized as existing deals. And there's a whole array of things that a company can do uh, to, to circumvent that restriction. So I'm, I'm certainly the paper looks good, the words look good. It'll be very interesting to see whether it, Europe sanctions uh, the Lind Group, which is a German natural gas technology player. It's a massive German company. They're providing key LNG technology for the German, for the Iranian natural gas sector. If they're not sanctioning the Lin Group or any other organization like that, then I don't think the Europeans are serious. And then Congress has the authority under this new sanctions law to go after the Lin Group and other technology providers because you did th something brilliant. You eliminated in the Iran Sanctions Act an exclusion under investment, which prior to this, companies providing technology, goods, and services were free to do so for the past 15 years. You closed that loophole, and you should be commended for that. Thank you very much. And I, I have additional questions, but I would like uh, permission to place them in writing. And Without I really want to thank you, Chairman Tams, so for, uh, for putting this hearing together. Uh, and I thank your staff, who worked hard. And I thank my own staff uh, for, for their hard work. At, and, uh, this was not an easy hearing to put together, and I, I know you persevered, and I want to publicly thank you and the professionalism of your staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you giving my staff praise because there's no raise. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Where's show me the money? <laughs> <coughs> I want to thank uh, all the witnesses for their testimony today, and I appreciate the participation of the members who attended the hearing as well. If there is one thing I think we can all agree on, it is that we must do everything we can to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. And we must cut off the Iranian support of terrorism. I believe in the key to doing that is through the financial services system. If banks currently doing business with Iran can be persuaded to withdraw from the Iranian banking market, it will put every significant pressure on the current regime. 
Congress has now given the State Department and Treasury the power to do just that. And we fully expect they will carry out the congressional intent. We will be watching, and so will the rest of the free world. They also will be watching. There is another important issue I would like to address. Some have argued that economic sanctions may have more of an adverse effect on the ordinary people of Iran than on the current regime. I think we're all concerned about that. However, I think we need to remember that continued trade with Tehran primarily benefits the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which despite its name is a business enterprise that controls almost 70% of the Iranian economy and the entire Iranian oil industry. It is important for the international community to deny resources to the regime, which are used to suppress the pro-democracy movement, some of whom have been working to help lift the veil on Iranian nuclear programs. In closing, let me say to my colleagues and to others, I will just say that there is very strong interest in this issue in the Congress. And I believe that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will be interested in ensuring that these economic sanctions are implemented effectively <coughs> and quickly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this hearing. Thank the members for attending. <laughs>